Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Welcome back. I'm excited today because my guest is Rebecca Blake. Rebecca is a teacher, artist, online class specialist, video editor, and spiritual life coach who lives in Los Angeles, California. Navigating life with an empowering context through present moment awareness awareness is a central and daily practice for her. Rather than viewing ADHD as a limitation, Rebecca has harnessed the positive aspects and utilizes them in a multitude of creative endeavors. She founded Camp Steep, a Burning Man theme camp in 2015 and continues to grow and expand that project. Additionally, she is a talented musician and artist having earned a Bachelor of Science in Entertainment Design from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Rebecca spends her time supporting communities she cares about and striving to make a difference in heart-centered ways. Yay, welcome Rebecca. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, we both went to the same school. That's cool. <laughs> that means oh, we, today. right? It means we <laughs> both uh, probably learned throughout life that if we predominantly use our right brain that and, and are being creative, that we're tapping into p- potentially our true being, right? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And so we're talking about ADHD, right? This podcast is a, what I like to refer to, an extreme new view of ADHD. And you don't have to agree with any of our point of views or if any questions are too personal. You know, I always respect the space uh, uh, that this podcast is, which is you're already being vulnerable, courageous. Uh, Often we've had guests who share sensitive information And uh, I always want to be respectful of that. Um, Other than that, we're just going to have a dialogue around ADHD. And I want to start with like, what is ADHD to you? Um, Oh, I'm I'm really excited about this conversation. I'm I'm really excited to crack into this. So uh, ADHD to me, you know, I didn't know that I uh, had ADHD until I was in college because I grew up. Um, I was homeschooled my entire life Mm. and, um, very much a sort of unschooling approach. And I had a lot of, uh, agency in how I learned, when I learned the format, um, what my curriculum was. I got to choose things based on my interests, um, I would go to book fairs and be offered multiple options in the area of different subjects and be able to choose for myself which one interested me the most. So I I got to live a life that was um, guided by my interests until I went to college, which was my first time being in a environment that was dictated by uh, someone other than myself uh, as far as learning preferences. So ADD didn't really reveal itself to me as a problem or a struggle or a challenge until I got to that point. Um, And so for me, that context has really guided my approach as a person, but also how I perceive ADD. It was during college that I discovered it as an issue and one of the main reasons why I was having a really hard time getting through certain things that other people Um, were finding easy. It was the first time that I realized that certain things were easier for other people than for myself. And, um, and I was so textbook that my therapist didn't even, you know, think I needed to do the test because it was like, oh, that's really expensive and you're just textbook. So, you know, let's just skip to the point. Uh Um, and so for me, ADD is an experience and um, and perhaps an approach and uh, and maybe an answer. 
Got it. Great. Um, I love that story and I love the word experience. Um, tell uh, I have a couple questions. So take me back to your childhood. Why or how come your parents decided to homeschool or unschool? Because that is a bit popular today, but wasn't maybe that popular when you and I were little, right? So <laughs> how come? I'm just curious because yay, parents. That's that's awesome. I know, right? Um, I'm I'm a huge supporter of um, intelligent homeschooling. That you know is not the the stereotype, right? The the stereotype for homeschooling is that you're sheltered and that you're not around other kids and right. Um, you don't get all of this exposure to all this stimuli. Ours was the opposite. We were in theater and sports and my, f I grew up religious. So we were at church multiple times a week and we, we had all this different exposure, but we also got to be with my mom in particular throughout the day as she was adulting. And, um, to, we learned how to interact with all different ages of people. Yeah. In fact, in most interestingly, it was my own personal age group that we had the least amount of interaction with because they were the ones who were in school all day long. <laughs> so we saw the least of them. Yeah. Um, but what got my mom uh, or my parents interested in homeschooling, interestingly, at first my mom was uh, against it, like very anti-homeschooling. Mm, interesting. And uh, we had moved, I was born in Texas, and my dad's job moved us back and forth between Texas and California a few times when I was younger and uh, eventually landing us here. Uh, and when we moved to California, we were way south in El Centro, which is mm -hmm. just, you know, right on the border of Mexico. And um, and I think it was someone that my mom met at church who was a foster parent and she had I think maybe seven kids and um, through a series of conversations was able to kind of crack my mom's opinion about homeschooling and to be honest with you I don't remember exactly what the turning point was for her I just remember that I think it had something to do with the moving back and forth and um, and that, you know, it was going to ultimately serve us a little bit better and be a little bit more travelable if mm -hmm. we were going to be moving. And uh, and so we when we moved from down south, we moved a little further north still in the south. We moved up to Rancho Cucamonga and lived there for almost a year before we then moved back to Texas again. So we bounced around mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, but once we started homeschooling, it just kind of worked. Um, and I have two other siblings and they were also homeschooled. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that I'm the, the one in particular that knows for certain that, um, homeschooling worked out better for me and was absolutely the best way I could have learned um, I think both my siblings now, I have a brother and a sister, I think that they have come into that um, just sort of feeling a, a sense of privilege in having been homeschooled, um, particularly the way that we were. We certainly, you know, were exposed to other homeschool kids who had been home for most of their life. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's interesting. And um would you so you chose to go to college yourself you yes. decided you wanted to go to college uh yes and i would also say that um, that was an approach that was very much encouraged in my family so mm -hmm. sort of expected that you would go to college somewhere for something um excellence was definitely very much a part of particularly my dad's conversation with reality and um, and so we definitely grew up in a space of you know, striving to do our best. Uh, I would say perfectionism was um, something that we had to navigate for sure. And um, but, y you know, like the the white picket fence kind of pathway was definitely a part of our 
mm-hmm. uh, encouraged growing up. <laughs> yeah, and, and so you you knew you were an artist and you wanted to go, was that your first art center was your college? Uh, no, I went to community college for first, okay. three-ish years before I went to art center and I transferred uh, as many units as I could to art center because I actually had a mentor who had gone to and taught at Art Center um, at my college, uh, my community college, and uh, he encouraged me to transfer as many units as I possibly mm. could to the school so that my load was as light as it could be. And and God bless him for it because honestly, um, without that, I don't know if I would have graduated. It was such an intense struggle. I remember you know, when an art center telling, like, not not getting to visit my parents, for instance, because the workload is so massive and nobody understands. Unless you mean at there. art center? Yeah, when I was at art center. And, um, you know, trying to find a way to prove to people that we were actually working that much. And I remember one week I clocked all of my hours. I got an app on yeah. my phone that had, you know, you could time, how much time you you spent doing different activities. And I clocked 126 hours of work. Wow. And um, two hours of play, which I remember that week very well because we watched Iron Man and it was, I was elated to not be working. Wow. Um, but that, that environment really brought the ADD to the surface. So let me ask you, you went to first a community college Mm -hmm. and the focus there was just like, I'm just going to go to college and I, I want to get a degree. So I'm going to get, I'm going to just go to college. Right. It wasn't necessarily that you were already set on going to art center. uh, 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 Oh, I was. You were. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, got it. I was, uh, I've always been a very determined and pretty directional kind of person. And so I think I knew that I wanted to go to either Art Center or Otis, but I had my eye on Art Center because I wanted to work in video games um, mm. or, or theme park design. So my, my degree is in concept art. Cool. Entertainment design. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. You, you're saying, so, so when did it, uh, uh, sort of the struggle first show up? In community college or when the pressure got turned up at our center at the next uh, college? Um, on the surface level, I would say it didn't show up until I was, um, I was an art center. However, looking mm-hmm. back on it and knowing myself a whole lot better now, I would say that there were times where it reared its head a little bit when I was in um, community college. Mm-hmm. But that only happened um, when and I would I would say not as a, a way of blame but just as a way of illustrating when there was a failure in the instruction, like that it, it failed to be interesting, or uh, to communicate in a way that I was capable of um, absorbing effectively. Yeah. 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 So um, let me tell you. You said earlier that your uh, therapist or the person you went to, right, it was a psychologist. Uh, I would imagine. Yes. Um, said that you were textbook do you remember what he or she meant by that or or what was referred to or or what did you experience that was so textbook um well uh the oh my goodness um when i get really stressed out is when the symptoms of add become almost unmanageable and so what happens is my, first of all, uh, my short-term memory becomes just like a, a goldfish, you know, <laughs> uh, I'll, yeah, I'll just like walk into another room and be like, why am I here? And that'll happen mm. all the time. Um, and then the other thing was, is constantly being late um, and having an extreme difficulty in being able to switch between tasks. So it takes a long period of time for me to go from one thing to another thing that may seem fairly similar to other people. So they may seem like similar tasks to other people. Um, 
I'll sit there and watch someone just stop doing one thing and start doing another thing and be mesmerized by that. Just how, <laughs> how did you just, just go over? How did you do that? Yeah. Really? Um, that <laughs> art center was definitely the place where I started to have baffling experiences like that. Cause I was working right next to a lot of other students. We'd be pulling a lot of all nighters. Other people's like style of work was very obvious. You know, you're working right there next to someone doing something with your hands. So you can kinetically observe another person's body language and, and how they're communicating with, with their mental sphere physically right yeah right. and I would see other people doing things very differently from me and not be able to understand what was happening and that would become confusing for me because they'd be producing results a lot faster than I would and I wanted to be able to do that and I would find myself because I'm a very kinetic learner um, and so it's mm. very strange to me to be able to observe someone doing something and to not be able to connect myself with the part of the brain that's working when they're doing it. So I, I started to notice frustration and confusion coming up. Mm -hmm. So frustration and confusion, um, and then the difficulty of uh, getting places on time. Fortunately, I was uh, I had other people that I was living with, and we would go to the same classes. So yeah, I solved that problem fairly well. Mm -hmm. But um, or I would just stay at school all night so that I was there the next morning when class started. Um, but uh, let's see what else. Um, uh, well, th I mean, there were a few other things that'll probably pop up as we're we're talking. But those are sure, some of the, sure. the first things that I I remember. Symptoms, yeah. And did you ever? You weren't the hi hyperactive type. No, um, I wouldn't say that I externalize that hyperactivity. However, when my stress levels are up. Um, it does become more apparent. I don't sit there. I don't have like ticks. I don't sit with my hand bouncing on my knee or mm -hmm. um, my foot jiggling very often. Um, but I do find that when I'm stressed out, one of the only ways that I can start to recenter is by dancing or going outside in nature or um physically moving or whenever I'm uh, in a, a happy state or a ideal state, I'm very physical, very embodied, very body centered, very um, expressive and yeah. animated. Yeah. That helps. Yeah. It's interesting because I had a, a podcast uh, interview yesterday with uh, Gabor Mate. I'm not sure if you're familiar with oh. Yeah. Gabor Mate. Yeah. I love his work. Uh, he's amazing. And it was really interesting because he just bring, just talking up to what you said, you said that, you know, when, when you get stressed or when it's overwhelming, right, the symptoms really start to kick in. And one of the things that he said was that um, as children, you know, when we're exposed to stress, um, Sometimes we call it trauma, but it's usually stress uh, by the parents or from the environment that one of the ways to react, um, that the nervous system reacts is you tune out, you, you disassociate, right? And eventually it becomes this like, oh, there's so much stress and overwhelm. I can't think I got to just, I, I got to leave the room. I got to, you know, I can't take it, right? I thought it was very interesting because... I was going to ask you some questions because, uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings is just because there's no drama doesn't mean there's no trauma. Uh, meaning sometimes people think they grew up in a great household. I did. My parents were together. We, you know, there was no divorce. There was no medical trauma, but there was a lot of stress and anxiety. So I'm wondering, do you, uh, can you recall or do, how do you feel about your family when you were growing up as a kid, uh, perhaps even right after birth or in your earlier years from whatever you remember, uh, is there something like that that you could perhaps that we could point to is that your nervous system started to be affected, right? Yeah. Um, 
It's a that's a very interesting question because I I do agree. It's um, I think that in certain cases there's obviously certain kinds of trauma that are very yeah. overt, right? Obvious, but, yeah. Um, it can also be very contextual and individual to the person. Absolutely. So I had a similar experience growing up. My my parents are still married today, um, and you know they they made a lot of really positive efforts for us and um you know are great people i i love my parents they're they they really do their best um at every given moment yeah um, which they all do i mean i would say for the most part most yeah. parents really work hard they really do the best they can you know yeah um when i was growing up i do remember when one time <laughs> And it's so it's so silly to be looking back on it, but um, it was so impactful and it was completely a misunderstanding. I was watching my mom um, have a, a intimate conversation with my younger brother um, from the stairway. They didn't know that I was there and they were making up about something. And my mom gave him this really sweet hug. And I was so jealous. Oh my gosh. I mean, I felt betrayed by mm. that. Like, she didn't love me as much as she loved mm-hmm. him. And. How old were you? Oh god, I was probably five and he was mm. maybe three and a half or something. I was very, very, very young. And uh, I decided that I was going to leave. <laughs> so I started to. <laughs> carry all of my crap out of the house <laughs> wow. I had so much crap <laughs> and I would you know go back for one pile and move it forward a little bit more and you know it was taking me like Aww. 45 minutes to move this massive pile of junk out the door and my mom catches me at some point and um, we have a conversation about what happened and why this was going on and you know, I was heartbroken, and it was complete. It had nothing to do with her. It had everything to do with how I saw that moment. Um, so when you, I shared that story because when you asked the question, that was the first thing that popped into my mind. And and while it's you know nobody's hitting anybody and there's no yelling, there's no, you know, it was I made it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and you know that's why we say just because there's no drama doesn't mean there's no trauma. Meaning trauma has such a heavy connotation in in our society right trauma simply is just stress that we haven't been able to process easily right like ptsd is really just extreme stress that hits you and you you startle and we can't process it especially as kids right yeah by the way lots of kids with uh, ptsd are misdiagnosed with adhds we're finding out um but that's a separate conversation but my question would also be was there any uh because uh, for me it's always fascinating right um another expert peter levine who deals a lot with mm-hmm. childhood trauma talks about medical uh, you know prenatal stress uh medical trauma during birth like i don't know if we're were you a c-section you know or was it natural or i was naturally of- born mm-hmm. oh wow oh cool not just like our boys yeah yeah um you know sometimes there's that and then there's like stuff where one parent is not around a lot, right? Mm-hmm. Traveling or absence. So then there's a lack of nurture. Or, and even like you said, you make up your own story of like, oh, my dad's gone a lot. Well, what if he doesn't come back? And then I only have my mom. And then you see your mom with your with your brother and you're like, well, and then if she doesn't pay attention to me as much as him, I'm toast, right? Right. The stress, the cortisol level, just shoots up so so that's why i'm thinking that like yours sounds kind of like mine it's not quite easy to put a finger on it and say oh that event definitely was it you know well you know i would say two things i i don't think that my um adhd or add in my case there's not really an, a diagnosable h um right but I, I don't really think that it comes from trauma with me. I think that it's really, and this is kind of my position about it, is that, uh, and I said it a little bit earlier, 
I think that ADD is an answer to something in in humanity. And and so the, I, the to the environment, right? Yeah. To, to how you're interacting with it. Yeah, because we're not given a choice about how we can navigate life. You either get stuck in your head and nothing ever happens because things go really slow up there. Yeah. Or you get into your heart and you suddenly find that if you follow your heart, that everything falls into place and all you have to do is trust and surrender and keep doing that. Mm. And, um, and we can talk a lot more about that, but I think that that is really sort of the answer element of ADD, ADHD. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think that also I can, when looking back, going back to what we were talking about with, with trauma and difficult experiences in early life, um, you probably could say that the amount that we moved during those formative years was fairly yeah. stressful because we moved when I was five and then we moved again when I was nine, eight then I was I was bit by a dog. Um, I was wow. I had I was sort of mauled in the face, and I had about half of my face reconstructed. Um, wow! So, but interestingly, I have I really, really do have very little trauma from that. Um, the only thing that I I sort of maintain as a, a lingering discomfort from that is actually getting like anesthetic shots in my mouth at a dentist. The mm -hmm. taste of that, um, is I, uh, I just, yeah. I had like my mouth was full of it in that surgery. So, um, I don't like it, but it's not, it's not like, Oh, I, you know, I'm like shocked into another state or having a flashback or, um, a nervous system right. overload. It's just like a hot, a very strong preference against it, and it reminds me of that. And how old um, were you? I was eight when that happened. Wow, that that must be terrifying, though. I mean, that's oof, like as a parent, you know, I have an eight-year-old. To think that a dog would, I mean, that's. Oof. I was For very a parent. Lucky. That's scary. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was very very lucky. I mean, people who are just listening to this audio, they can't exactly see my face, but it came out very well. It looks amazing. I was yeah. going to say, I yeah. zero idea. Yeah, you know, and I've met you in person. It's not like yeah. I was very wow. lucky that on call um, was a world class children's plastic surgeon, and mm. um, and so I got the best treatment and I actually wore a burn mask for a year that kept the scars from having any texture to them so wow. I was very very lucky in how that was treated I was also very very lucky in that I did not maintain any trauma you know my my dog is sleeping right here at my feet right now she, I, I love dogs yeah yeah so I'm yeah. really grateful that yeah it's interesting <laughs> that and that's that's definitely a big impact and you know I feel like what happens often with a nervous system that, you know, Peter Levine talks about it, the somatic experiencing where the body stores the, the trauma and then it comes out in ways, like you said, you, 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 you feel good when you physically move, right? When you, yeah. I have the same thing. Like I like to do, I wish I could do this podcasting while I'm hiking, you know, like uh, <laughs> that kind of, you know, uh, so it's interesting uh, that that might have contributed to uh, additional stress, but certainly as a kid moving a lot uh, would be very stressful because, you know, kids, as you know, we want to feel safe and rooted and we like certainty, right? We like to know where are we going? Where, who am I talking to? How much at, longer are we going to get there? <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> but on the flip, on the flip side of that is, you know, same with our kids. We've moved now since they were born. I think we're in our fourth house and sort of in a similar area, but now we moved to Ohio, which is a little further away. But I believe on the flip side, our children, like yourself, you become more uh, adaptive and you can reinvent yourself. You can meet new people anywhere. You're not stuck, you know, like in this sort of boxy way of living. So it, it, it's a, could be stressful, could be, triggering but it's also uh, my belief is uh, any trauma or stress once you overcome it is a gift right 
Absolutely. Um, now, uh, did you, when you were, so you were officially diagnosed then without necessarily the test, but it was clear. Um, and then did you ever, did you try medication or are you on medication or? I did take medication um, when I was in art center. So one of the, the main reasons why I ended up in therapy is because I was experiencing some serious depression. Um, there was a, a, you can call it a public humiliation, but um, I there was a big event that happened. I was very at involved. School. Yeah, yeah, at school. Um, I was on uh, student government and I was very, very active and very visible and I took a really, really intense stance against something that was happening um, within my department that had, a, had to do with the administration and some political moves that were going on. I exposed a lot of people. Oh, wow. um, I kind of like blew the whistle. Um, yeah. And, you know, some people don't know how to handle information that they don't want to hear. And um, I still to this day don't know who did this, but they printed out my email, wrote slurs about me on it, posted it every four feet wow. in school. And I woke up. Um, actually, I was at Disney for an internship uh uh, interview sort of a thing and I got calls from the dean of students and the president of student government I was VP and uh, some friends at school and they were all asking me what, what's going on with this and wow. I was stuck in the bathroom at Walt Disney Animation Studios bawling my eyes out because I couldn't understand how someone could do something so cruel and mm. and you know why would they even do that <laughs> trying to expose something and so yeah. I, I I took on a pretty heavy um, victim mentality at that that point and I went I immediately dissociated and I experienced really severe depression and um, I actually had to resign from uh, student government because I no longer had the presence to run meetings um, I couldn't keep people in control because my self-esteem had dropped so far down. I, I just couldn't bring myself to interrupt people. You know, it was just it it broke my ability um, to perform. Yeah. And um, and so I ended up in therapy because I was just desperate to f figure out what went wrong. And, and it was like a switch had flipped. It wasn't like this slow, gradual thing. It was like suddenly I made my mind up about something and then I promptly forgot what I made my mind up about and took my finger off of the switch and no longer knew how to turn that thing off. And so I um, went through several different therapists before I found myself with one that was quite good and could um, dance with my, my brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was after many sessions that, and you know, and I'm telling him everything that I'm dealing with. I, I had a, a psychologist who I'd sit and talk with, but I also had a um, psychiatrist who would prescribe things in unison. So, And this was for depression at first. It was for depression at first. And I was very, yeah. very clearly disassociative depressed. And... Um, you know, we did a lot of work on that and it really didn't get me very far. It just kind of kept me from getting worse. <laughs> and the mm. medication just sort of helped me get through things, but it didn't make me better. And, yeah. um, and I was dealing with, you know, lots of stuff like insomnia, hypersomnia simultaneously too. Um, and concentration issues, you know, it, it, it threw my ADD through the roof. So we, you know, we got but the... You, mm. The depression you hadn't been diagnosed that, or you, you didn't know at that time yet, right? Right. We got the depression under control, but then the stress, the impact of the stress is still there. And so the ADD is then just kind of what's obvious at that point. And mm -hmm. he's like, it's just, it's very clear that this is what you're dealing with. And I had done, you know, I was curious about it, go home and do all these different tests and things online, checking myself, you know, I was very, I've always been a very curious person, very interested in kind of dissecting myself and seeing like, why is it that I'm so different from other people? And it became very obvious in college. So I was doing a lot of that sort of inspection, trying to figure out how to get myself back to zero. And, um, 
And eventually, you know, after long conversations with my therapist, he was like, this is what's going on. Why don't we try medication? Because medication works very differently for people who have ADD than people who don't. So if we try some and it produces a certain result, then we'll we'll know one way or the other. We'll know. What is what did he mean by uh uh, I'm not sure if I understood. You mean the difference between ADD and ADHD, or he? What did he mean by if you try medication, it's really different you, for people? Well, so people who don't have ADD, the medication mm-hmm. for ADD is different. It it their brains oh, yeah, respond yeah. very differently to medication rather than you know a person with ADD. They take the medication and suddenly they're what people would call normal because the mm-hmm. parts of their brain that are not in sync with each other are now more in sync. Hmm. So, so that was one of the, he was kind of like, well, you know, you could either do this thousands and thousands of dollars worth of, you know, diagnostic tests, or, you know, we can take my word for it because honestly, this is all fairly textbook and try the medication. And depending on the result you get there, we'll definitely know. Mm -hmm. Well, I did the medication and it was very clear that it was working for me. Mm -hmm. In what way? Was it Adderall or something like that? Yeah, I did. I went through, I think, three different types of ADD medication. I tried Vyvanse. Um, They put me on Vyvanse first just because that's kind of standard to make sure that people aren't going to abuse it. Um, Wasn't an abuser. So uh, eventually it made more sense for me to go on to Adderall, which actually did work better for me. I had a manic episode on Vyvanse, very interestingly. Um, but that's the, and that's the only time that's ever happened. And I'm sort of grateful that it happened because for that, that period of time that I was on that med, now I know what a manic episode is when I, when I see it happening, I know, but, um, I never had any problems like that with Adderall. Uh, and so that's, that ended up being what worked well for me. Um, and what, what were the main, the major differences that you felt? This was at school, right? You're still at Art school. Center. Yeah. And what did you notice right away or how did it affect you? Well, um, it allowed for me to maintain a train of thought and to focus on something for an extended period of time. Something that I wasn't already interested in focusing on. That's the That's a real key because I... I think one of the superpowers of ADD is when you're doing something that you're meant to be doing, you hyperfocus, and you have absolutely yep. no trouble maintaining a lengthy train of thought or sorting out a incredibly complex problem. Um, but on the other end of that spectrum is if you're doing something that is against your true nature or against your path or your you know however you want to put that. Uh, it's basically impossible to get your brain on board with it because your heart just says, nope, 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 nope. And it cuts your train of thought up into little tiny pieces. And, uh, and so what it would help me with was that it would help me do things that I wasn't really in alignment with and get it done Mm -hmm. so that I could graduate. And would it fair, would it be fair to say that it was usually predominantly kind of left brain type of activities or organizing scheduling spreadsheets numbers or things that weren't necessarily creative um definitely i would say like a highlight on those things um but you know going to art center and being a designer a lot of those approaches are very organized and mathematical, and it's a process-based approach to creativity. So it's very left-brained art. Um, the I, I the degree that I have is in industrial design. It's not a um, bachelor's of fine arts. It's a bachelor's of science, and right. yeah. So you know we were learning things like. Um, physics and uh, electronics and um, car design and sculpture for production and um, wood shop and construction and, you know, like along with illustration and color and design principles and um, but mostly the thought process. Right. And 
the level of demand, I think, was probably one of the things that threw me off so much because I couldn't manage my time very well. And that's where the medication helped me. It helped me shift between tasks so that I could manage my time because most of my time would end up breaking down in the, the space between tasks. And that was where I could just end up in a black hole. And, mm. uh, and so the medication helped with that. It helped me yeah. with whatever that thought process is that stops you from being on time places. Like you just end up in a, a time warp you have no idea how it ended up being this hour and yeah you know and you're like well shit i got to get out the door <laughs> um it would help it would help stop that i and i still to this day don't know what that thing is i just know when i'm feeling it um but it would it would prevent me from going into that that time warp zone where time would just kind of flow weird and are, so are you still on medication today or how no. or did you how long were you on medication for? I was on medication for, I think maybe, maybe two years. And this is to to sort of finish school. Yeah, and I would say I would I would definitely say that I could not have made it through school without the medication, hmm. uh, just given the level of stress. Uh, yeah, understandably so. Um, and wh- why did you? Uh, stop medication or discontinue what happened what was the reason for it and how are you doing without it today that's different Um, to compare to back then right yeah so there was uh so you know i was simultaneously dealing with depression and um right i was on i think I think it was when they prescribed me the sixth medication that I was like, no, <laughs> no Not more. Six at the same, you don't mean at the same time, like the yeah. sixth type? Mm-hmm. Okay. No, I was on six different medications because I was on something. I mean at the same time? At the same time. Wow. Six? Yeah. Man, I don't have a record board, but I'm going to have to start putting people in there and go like, who's had the most? <laughs> the That's most pretty high pills. for it was wow. a lot. So this was, was for depression, anxiety, what sleeping, ADHD, and pretty gay? much regulating every single wake sleep functionality. I had, I was wow. taking Celexa and Wellbutrin and New Vigil, and um, and then I was taking Adderall, and uh, and then they prescribed me. A sleeping pill. Um, I, I forget what that's called, but it's. Wow, you know, it blows my mind because, like, who know? I've always said this, and this is not just in relation to uh, medication. This also in relation to cleaning products or right chemicals around the house or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm always like thinking, who figured out to say, well, if you take those six at the same time, should be okay. Like right. none of them are, you know, none of them are gonna fuck with each other, and n- none of the. Th- three or the six will end up causing something like it's almost like a gamble i i don't think they've tested all the cross combinations of drugs because that would take millions of years so i'm just always amazed i'm so glad that you are alive and healthy because that's that's a gamble did you ever not feel like i mean taking all these pills was there ever an issue a side effect or a i mean you mentioned the manic episode but was there something that you remember where it was like too much? Obviously, we're getting to why you quit them, but um. right. Um, well, I would say that it was primarily the fact that they weren't really working. Mm. You know, they were getting me through school, and it was helping enough to make me be able to perform at the level necessary to graduate. But that was not a place that I wanted to live my life. You know, I was very, very clear that I did not want to live a life that was about performing for other people. And that's, and, and college was the first time that I had to do that. It was the first time that I had to conform myself to a standard that someone else created. And I just knew that wasn't right. Not like there's a right or a wrong, but like it wasn't what I was meant for. 
It's not what I'm here for. I was just real, real clear about that. And yeah. it was evident in the fact that in order to even be able to meet the most basic level of this standard that someone else had invented, I had to pump myself full of all of these chemicals that were going to change the way that my hormones and neurotransmitters operated in order to, you know, fake it till you make it in a really severe Fun function, way. right? In order to be a yeah. productive citizen. You know, quote it's interesting unquote. because, quote unquote, right? <laughs> um, one of our other experts, uh, Tom Hartman, who's now no longer an ADHD, you know, he's done his ADHD stint and was a psychiatrist, but now he's into, uh, he's a political talk show host and very successful, but he wrote a bunch of books on ADHD. And one of the things he always said was that he would say ADHD starts when kids go to school. And now it's changed over the years because we're now medicating kids as, as young as two years old. I found out the other day it was a two year old, one of the first I've heard. And you know, it is what it is. I'm not anti meds. I'm, I'm anti making meds the first line of defense or the, you know, the first option. Yeah. Uh, but my point is that his, his point was, uh, and it's slightly different with you because you were homeschooled or unschooled is that when kids first go into a structured environment, the way you just described it, where there's now a performance expected and a comparison to other performers. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a competitiveness that's totally expected at the same time everybody gets a participation award right in in uh preschools and kindergarten and all that stuff it's kind of like saying let's not compete but then once you go into you know elementary school it's already the race is on right right and so i always find that idiotic but anyway he said you know <laughs> what it starts when kids go to school and it stops when they graduate mm. and you're not you're not the first person that i talked to that that, you know, once I graduated and once I kind of started my own business and did my own thing, yeah, I'm still different. My brain still works differently than other people's yeah. and I still forget shit, but I don't really feel like I need medication or have really strong ADHD. So it's just interesting. It reminded me of that, you know, so you were done with college and then it was, it just, was it like you just went to the therapist and said, Hey guys, I'm, I think I'm going to wean myself. We're going to wean myself off here. So we're going to wean even. me off. I didn't even do that. I was just cold like, turkey. Cold. I was just like, nope. I didn't. I couldn't Damn. cold turkey everything. I um. I cold turkeyed Adderall. Adderall was actually the easiest one to get off of. It took me three days to be completely like not missing it. Um, but interestingly, the hardest one to get off of of was Celexa. That was that took me. I think four four to six months to wean off of, and I was just having to chip. Wow. A, a little that was piece for depression? Off. Yeah. 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 That, yeah, went, yeah. that and Wellbutrin were really hard to get off of. Um, the others and were what do you not hard mean to get by, off. What do you mean by hard to get off of? Meaning if you didn't take it, you would notice it? Or or, or how, oh. how would you? Oh, my God. Yeah. I would. Um, I, I don't even know how to describe that experience. Uh, it was incredibly uncomfortable. Not physical. Mentally. Um, I would be just incapable of uh, managing my thoughts and connecting thoughts. Um, and I basically kind of felt like I hadn't slept in five days, which going to art center, I know what that feels like. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's a really yucky feeling and I, I felt like my brain was just you know if I if I stayed off of it for a couple of days I I, I felt like something bad was happening to my brain it was very very mm. very uncomfortable extremely noticeable and um, it, it just yeah I, I wish I had better Crazy, words for yeah. that but it was it was yeah, yeah. an unparalleled level of mental discomfort we'll just put it that way I was going to say anything that's uncomfortable or discomfort is a good word probably to use. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wh how were your parents about this? Did they know about it? I mean, you're an adult, obviously, but did you share it with them and how did they feel about it? Or what was their opinion on taking that many drugs at the same time? Um, you know, honestly, they were supportive. Um, and my mom, you know, I grew up, bless her, uh, because I owe a lot of, my what saved me to my my mom and how I grew up 
Um, sh- I grew up with nutritionists and chiropractics and uh, herbalism and all of these sorts of things. And yeah. uh, and that is ultimately one of the things that, that saved me from meds. Um, mm. But health and um, striving for it in a natural way was something that I grew up with. My mom knew that taking all of those meds was not a great thing, Mm. but she also supported me in my goal to graduate and to overcome that because she knew that I I would be a very incomplete person if I hadn't beat that. Just not, um, not for anybody else, but myself either. Right. Completed. Yeah. 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 I am, I am something of a completionist, not, not religiously, but, um, there's certain things in my life where when I set my mind to it, if I don't, if I don't complete it for some reason, um, if I don't mm-hmm. push myself, then I'll always wonder what would have happened if I had. Um, which it turns out actually that all of the struggles that I dealt with in Art Center were the fuel for the greatest transformation that I ever experienced. And I wouldn't know that for another year after I had graduated. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, it was instrumental for me to get off of all of the meds because I wanted to know what I was like. I wanted to know where I was at. After a couple of years, I wanted to know who who I was without all of that stuff. And was it a little bit uh, like, uh, oh, I actually wanted to ask you something before I forget. Sounded a little bit like you're, you got some of that, I need to complete it from your dad, right? He seemed to be someone who believed in let's get a degree, let's get it, let's, let's have something completed, right? Which is very common, obviously, for parents. Absolutely. Curious. Absolutely. Definitely got that from my dad, without a doubt. Uh, yeah. My mom, um, my mom did not graduate. So that was definitely not a thing with her. Uh, it's yeah. not a story that she carried around. Um, but I've always classically identified a little bit more masculine. And, um, and so that that sort of more masculine approach of, you know, get a degree, get, get a job, get, a, you know, that was more something that I identified with than, you know, get married, have kids, like be a housewife. That, that has never, never been, um, on my yeah. mind. So it's interesting different. that, uh, yeah, no, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you used that word. Cause often, you know, it gets a lot of heat when I talk about masculine and feminine energy and we both have it right. Men and women, we both have it. It's a it's a matter of balance and and how it's used and when it's used and you know if you're in a partnership, uh, it doesn't have to be heterosexual. It's the same for you know, LGBTQT. How many have we added some letters? I'm forgetting LGBTQTMF. You know it doesn't matter because there will always be a dance, right? And what what I'm finding, what we've also found in our research, is that when women um, are uh, sort of not, I don't want to say conditioned, but you know what I mean, when they're conditioned to create certainty in life, um, that is actually a masculine's uh, a masculine trait. And it's the traditionally the men's uh, not duty, but we're, we are wired that way. Like I, as a man, as a husband of my family, I'm wired to provide certainty and safety for my family. It's just what it is. Yeah. And, and if you take a, a, say a lesbian couple, you'll have one of the women more likely to be that person. Right. And it sounds like from your dad, you got that, like, get, get a degree. That's how you get a job, make money, and then you'll be independent and you, you're strong. Right. Which is yeah. certainly a great, great quality. Right. Um, but what we're finding nowadays is that when uh, uh, when women are pushed into that direction, and it's like you said, it's you're, you're being in the masculine a lot, right? Then it's stressful because women aren't wired to 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 do that. They can, right? A woman can be a CEO, of course, no problem. But the amount of stress that's that's uh, uh, what's the word projected at that at that woman is intense. And, well, and I think you know, it, it's so, also about like being forced to do it a certain way, yeah, like saying exactly. that you 
can't be a CEO if you can't perform this way. You ought exactly. to be able to do this. And and what I've discovered is that you can perform at incredibly high levels from a heart-centered space where you're being yep. simply guided by a principle and a goal. And, yeah. and that is an emergent reality. So you're embracing surrender and... Um, and trust and faith and uh, you're practicing all of these principles, right? But you're, and you can even sit down and have a plan, but ultimately when you're doing it, you're in this more feminine space of receiving everything as it's, it's coming and you're, mm -hmm. you're reacting to it in a way that's driving towards that goal and principle. And, and, and it comes to you. It will come to you. But yeah. I have not experienced a failure in this area. It works. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting because a lot of you know nowadays, if you say let's take a CEO woman in a business nowadays, let's say you're the CEO of AT and T, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, where our world currently is at, you know, it's a high stress. It's a high power. It's a make a lot of money. It, you could say it's almost it's almost an overdrive of creating certainty and income so that you have so much, right? And I think if a woman goes in there from the feminine, like you were talking about, you could turn that business around and perhaps in the end, everybody would realize we don't need to make a hundred billion dollars a year. We can make $10 billion a year, but we can surrender. We can do more fun stuff, be creative. We, we don't have to be so masculine overdrive, you know, money, which really is just we're wired to provide certainty. So if you let us go too far, right, we will own countries, which we shouldn't. <laughs> I, you know? I couldn't I couldn't agree more. In fact, one of the uh, things that I like to harp on as um, a, a potential like one sweep solution for the planet is um, to abolish the GDP and to measure like measure for something human. Because, happiness or yeah, yeah. or they, they do that in I think it's in Bhutan, Bhutan, yeah. mm -hmm. right? It, where they measure the happiness of the country as the first most important measure. Right. So there's actually there's a precedent for this, and it shows that it works. So, so it's well, that's it's possible. That's the that's <laughs> what I would say if if that president of Bhutan is a man, or if a woman, I don't know if it's a woman or a man, but either way that human being has a good balance of masculine feminine because yes. they figured, you know what, we can have both. We can have income and we can, you know, be happy. Whereas in this country, oh, we're getting a little sidetracked. That was my doing, uh, <laughs> but I want to, but I want to get back. And I do have some kind of big, bigger picture, spiritual uh, questions as well. Um, but to take me back. So, so you, you graduate, right? Oh, yeah. so no, I had another, another question was, so your mom uh, was a practitioner or more like introduced sort of herbal healing, natural medicine, that kind of stuff, yeah. right? That's yeah. Part of your family. Yes. Yeah. So um, we we consumed um, natural health really Got it. things. Got it. And um, and you know, as religious as we were, she also was interested in energy work and things like that. And so nice. um, I grew up with a exposure to energy work and to herbalism and nutrition. And uh, and those were some of the things that had gone out. Well, and and religion. So uh, I'll put that one on the table and as well. And what kind of religion? Um, I grew up Protestant Christian. My family was Church of Christ Christian. So for anyone who knows what Church of Christ is like, <laughs> it's a pretty interesting. It's the Church of Christ. Yeah. One. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's pretty, it's extremely conservative. You know, no dancing, no clapping, no um, music, oh. four-part harmony, like acapella, um, wow. congregational singing, you know, like it, 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 it's a... It's a special mm -hmm. place, and a lot of good people in the Church of Christ. Um, and I learned a lot of really great, great things. And there's also some very, very strange problems <laughs> with that oh, church. Of course, as uh, there is with all I religion. Always, <laughs> yes, yes. I always joke that I, I grew up Roman Catholic, and now I'm just Roman. No <laughs> it's my joke. <laughs> but so, my question would be, I. 
Do you think, you know, this is kind of a fun exercise. I could imagine your parents talking in the kitchen, right? You just announced, and I know it probably didn't go down this way, but let's say you say, hey guys, I'm going to take these pharmaceutical drugs. I'm dealing with depression and I need, you know, all that stuff. I'm, I'm going to do it. And they're in the kitchen and you're a fly on the wall. And do you think, and I don't want to lead the witness here, but do you think that it was probably your dad pushing for making that okay? And your mom maybe feeling like if I, we could do it natural, be great, but I know you wanted to finish school or how do you think that conversation went down? You know, honestly, I have no idea because I wasn't there for it and they weren't a part of, of it. <laughs> I sure, was so sure. sure. I'm just hypothetically thinking. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's very interesting because from the moment I moved out, I was extremely, I, I always have been extremely self-driven, um, extremely independent and uh, very stubborn, very not, there's not a lot of people who will go up against me whenever I've set my mind to something. Yeah. Um, and, and bless them for trying, because it doesn't usually work. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, like, I, I, I don't even know if a conversation like that happened. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. Mm. Uh, you know, it might have gone something like, well, Rebecca's going to be taking this now. Well, why is she doing that? Uh, well, apparently she's dealing with this. Well, okay then. And that might be what it sounded like. I, I yep. don't know. There may have also been some questioning like, well, does she, do you think she really needs that? Well, she's going to a doctor and the doctor says this. So, you know, and yeah. my, my dad is very much on the, the doctor side of things. You know, if doctor prescribes it, then it's safe and yep. it's fine. You know, um, yeah. whereas I, I really kind of growing up in the middle of those those two realities, the natural health world and um, the medical Western med medicine approach, I really learned to question. And, um, and, and, and in particular, question Western medicine um, and the Western approach. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, I whenever I graduated school, my number one priority was to get better and to heal and to be whole and not to have to depend on some sort of medicine to cover up what was clearly a fixable problem because a, a switch had flipped. There's got to be a way to flip that switch the other way. And so I was very interested in figuring out the mechanics of this situation because I knew that if I could get my hands on whatever part of myself it was that switched that that on or off, yeah, I'd I wouldn't need any of the meds. So I completely got off of all the meds. Good for you. You know, however long it took. Um, and I felt better because one of the things, you know, particularly with the ADHD medication, um, I, it's like my chest would feel compressed. You have to monitor your blood pressure every day because, uh, you know, you just by taking it, your blood pressure goes into a medium zone and you have to make sure that it's not going into a, a dangerous zone, right? So yeah. the, I could feel the pressure on my heart physically. And, and that was a great thing to leave behind because ultimately it felt kind of yucky. It felt like I was dirty. Yeah. Um, so to, to feel just like I could take a free breath and um, to not have that, mm, that buzzing uh, was really you know, welcome. Wow. Yeah, um, yeah. And then getting off of all the rest of it. But uh, I, I decided to incorporate in the things that I had left behind whenever I went to college, thinking that maybe there was some sort of answer in those things. So I prioritized my health in a natural way, nutrition um, and supplementing with plants and herbs and, uh, and vitamins and minerals. Uh, making sure I was getting what my body needed, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I started to do a more spiritual approach because that had gone very um, by the wayside. I didn't have time, quote unquote, for yeah. any yeah. sort of spiritual practice when I was going to school. And I uh, I decided when I was doing that, because I, I started to have some epiphanies in that world, having some realizations started when I, I went to college and um, actually the first moment was whenever I was exposed to cannabis for the first time and I realized that 
nothing was as I had been told. And so it, that really, you know, like experiencing the reality of it versus experiencing what I had been taught to believe. Um, but you're talking about the entire matrix, the system, everything. Yeah, yeah. It started. That was the witnessing cannabis at my first ever college party. Was mm. um, that was the first time I started to really question things because I just realized how different the reality was from what I had been told, and I and so eventually I ended up um, smoking pot, and that's what I replaced all of the medication with. Successfully replaced every single medication with specific mm. strains of cannabis. This was uh, right after uh, college, right after yeah. Art Center. Yeah. Yeah. So I got off all of the meds and um, started to incorporate in more nutrition. Um, I started studying herbalism um, as a practitioner. Um, so I'm not one of the things that I, I do, which I don't think I included in that bio was, um, I'm a professional herbalist. Oh, wow. There's just too many things that I do to include. Jack in of all <laughs> It's, it's, uh, but I think that that's sort of the, the trademark of a heart centered path is that you're going to pick up a, a lot of different yeah. skills along the way. Yeah. And, and by the way, that a lot of times uh, people, uh, diagnosed with ADHD are made fun of uh, as jack of all trade, master of none. But the time has come in, in this world at this time that we're actually we need uh, uh, jack or uh, jack of all trades, you know, because things are shifting so quickly, you know. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad you're, um, um, you're you have skills and, and expertise in a lot of you know things. Well, right? I I think that it's it's important for us to realize that um, someone with multiple skills isn't necessarily not a master. In fact, I think that multiple skills yep. can point to a deeper sense of mastery. Um, and a, yeah, it's uh, one of the things that's really interesting, um, I find that whenever I'm on my quote unquote path, that new skills come to me instantly. Like It's mm -hmm. like I already knew how to do them. And uh, yeah. so I could sit down and just know what I'm doing. And I know, you know, I maybe witness somebody do it once or twice or, um, but like when the time is right, this, it just comes to me. Yeah. And so that, that's how I've picked up all of these different skills as I've gone along. And um, sometimes I have thought that, you know, oh, well, that was a short lived thing and I'll never use it again. But, um, this year, I actually ended up um, saving the business that I work for by using skills that I had thought I were retired for forever. Wow. So, you Good know, you. Yeah. it's it's never it's never too late for those skills that you thought that you would <laughs> never use again to have a meaningful That's true. use. Yeah. You know, I, I, I had some uh, I had a therapist uh, in the early 2000s and it, it, it was just, it was like, I was confused. I didn't know really what I was doing in life. And I just thought, I'll go see someone just to talk. And, and I remember telling her, she's like, what are you good at? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a DJ. I can do music. I can uh, photography, filmmaking, you know, I can, uh, uh, I'm advertising, I'm, you know, all, sports, all these things. And she's like, use all of them. And I was like, yeah, but how I can't, it, it, you know, and nowadays, like literally 20 years later, or 18 years later, I am using all the skills, yep. you know, so it just took time for me to find what I really wanted to be passionate about or what I was passionate about. And then all the skills came in handy. That is so cool to hear you say, because I have the same experience. And I remember there being a time not too many years ago where I wondered if my life would ever come together in any meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it just felt like all of these uh, planets out in the far reaches of the solar system of yep. me that were never going to align. But, um, you know, trust yeah. that it's going to come together because if you're following... If you really have a, a consistent commitment to a purpose, I, I really do believe that um, all of the things that all of your life experiences and skills and whatever has come of them um, will yeah. will show to have meaning and, and fulfillment totally. in that. And yeah. I think it's what you just got me present to. This is my own interpretation of it. You know, we're running around in life uh, wondering what our purpose is. 
Well, our purpose is to keep growing and healing. That's it. There's no, like, like once when I'm on that path, what I'm supposed to be doing shows up because I'm healing, I'm transforming myself. And then I get inspired about things and I do them and I'm like, oh, I'm fulfilled. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing, right? Yeah. So I just got present to when you said that, which is beautiful. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when, the, the way that I like to put it is that um, life, life has no meaning, yep. but it has, it has a purpose. And that purpose is to have an experience, mm-hmm. to actually experience being alive. That's enough. Yeah. And, you know, like if we ever get beyond um, the need to learn or grow, like we have we recognize that these are states of being that we are and we cease to have like a focus on them like an addiction. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I find for myself that that's kind of like the last bastion of of identification with reality is like I, I, yeah. I, I like to learn. And, um, but there was a time where I had this really big awakening. It was actually the moment that I, um, experienced healing from depression. And, uh, I had this huge, massive expansion in my consciousness and my awareness and, um, and the need to learn ceased to be a focus and I was learned and I became that which I had been pursuing and in that moment of recognition I realized that all that was left on the other side of of having being and doing all of the things that you think you should have be and do is experience is to be simply to be now 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 right here in this moment and there is nothing else I mean, ultimately, there is nothing else. Everything else is just this conversation that we're having. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> what's interesting is, if I may loop it back to ADHD, because something you said earlier, I made a little mental mark. Um, if you had mentioned that you were um, entering this this school phase where you needed to perform and, you know, there was things you had to do, right? And and that's a reflection of our world, right? There's things we have to do. And the question would be, if you didn't have to do those things, if you could just do, and I don't mean whatever you wanted to do as in like, oh, I'll just go party and lay around lazy, right? Most people would say, well, that's not, you know, but I'm, I'm really thinking if you would do whatever you wanted to do, like inspired moment to moment to moment, right? Yeah. Would you still have ADHD or, and and let me take this, let me rephrase this just to be clear for my, my sort of people that follow our show. Would you still have this thing that we call ADHD? That's a really, um, that's a, that that question's exciting to me. It's Um, interesting, right? I've never thought about it myself. I never posed it that way, but since we're talking about this beautiful being moment to moment, right? I think that because, okay, so to me, ADHD slash ADD is something that is observed often, Mm -hmm. right? So people look at you, they label you different, and then they give that kind of difference a a name and they call it ADHD and, you know, we're done. Yeah. And, um, But but it's observed in seeing you interact with an environment that isn't what you choose to and love doing inspired doing moment by moment. Right. Right. The friction is what they they're observing. Right. Not, not necessarily the thing, the yeah. whatever we call it disorder, the, you know, symptoms, it's the right. friction. Yeah. Right. People are observing symptoms, but the symptoms are only arising because of the rigidity of the system. Yeah. Yeah. And it's your, it's your response to, to the fr- your struggle with or your response to the friction which is seen as a struggle and then it's a symptom and then yeah so let's let's see if i can actually uh, illustrate this mental image that i have of what's actually going what i think is actually going on in cool. consciousness so 
inside of the system, the system is rigid and it continues forward and it does what it does the way that it does it and it does it the same way every single time. But consciousness is ever expanding, changing and um, evolving. Right. So as that evolution is occurring, there's all these new spaces opening up inside of reality for opportunities of action and opportunities to manifest things that are intended to manifest as a result of that expansion. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, because you have a system that is repetitive and isn't changing and evolving with consciousness itself, there are now all these gaps. There's all these blank spaces where stuff is supposed to be happening. Right. Stuff is supposed to be happening there in order to manifest the reality that is changing, evolving and emerging as a result of that phenomenon. Right. Yeah. Well, people, humans are the expression of consciousness in physical reality. We are choice. We Mm. are free will. That's what we are. Nothing else has that. We are the existence of free will in the universe. And so. I think that ADD is the answer to the blank spaces. And we seem to bounce around a lot to other people because the people in the system are following the train tracks, but we're filling in the gaps. Now, when you say the answer, you mean the response to? Well, so in order for the evolution to be complete, it has to manifest in physical form, right? So yeah, consciousness expands and there's all these new spaces that open up in consciousness. And whenever Mm -hmm. we step into those spaces and start acting from those new places, those new spaces of potential and possibility, stuff starts to happen. Matter starts to form things, change, shift Mm -hmm. and occur. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you start to get observable things in physical reality happening that are new and different. But inside of a system that is doing the same thing over and over and over again, all of those new spaces can potentially go completely untouched. So now consciousness has to put in some, you know, some tricksters, some some beings that are willing to bounce around, adapt, change and be a little odd Mm -hmm. so that something can happen in those new spaces. Sure, sure. And uh, and that's that's what I think. Uh, yeah, we are, uh, okay. is the answer. We're, I think I I get I get you. Yeah, I think I I got there in my own way, which is I've said this from the beginning of this this uh, project is that um, kids who are diagnosed with ADHD actually are better suited to adapt and and reinvent and really take us to the next level of evolution yeah. in this society, right? Hence, yeah. superpower. Now, yes, we can't do it with just people with ADHD. We need the opposite brains, which are the farmers and the hunters, right? They need yeah. to work together because in this world, in the current system, the way this world works or functions well is because of spreadsheets and because we've created time, because we've created money, because, you know, if those things w- didn't exist again, we wouldn't need we wouldn't have this friction with the what you call as well the system right yeah uh, if you go to school and suddenly you have to sit down and you have to pay attention to stuff that's boring and nowadays you can youtube or google it so it's outdated and you're like what the fuck am i doing here <laughs> that, that's not your issue it's not like you have a disorder it's that the system is bringing up that friction you have with the environment yeah and now it's seen as a often defiance or, you know, checking out or not interested or, you know, um, and then it's a disorder. So my next question would be, do you have you personally, and you can, we can also make it uh, general, but do you have any benefit today to still identify yourself with ADHD? Um, It, yeah, occasionally when, um, when I am really stressed out, for instance, this year, there's, there's been a lot of stress, a lot of, um, very intense, new and different stimuli or the lack thereof. And, um, that has caused occasionally some 
some of the ADD to arise uh, in, you know, sometimes very sudden and intense ways. Um, now, let me let me ask you, would it, but wouldn't you be able to say to, let's say you're with people or at work or whatever, just to, to call it stress, not ADHD, or, you know, I'm trying to see what benefit do you get? What, uh, you know, landmark terms, it's like, what's the payoff people get? Well, yeah, in, like those moments, right? Uh, but I, other, I don't mean uh, this in a negative way. Yeah, I no, no, no. I, I, right. I got gotcha. you. Um, the everybody else is stressed out too, though, right? But they're still able to do things in a certain way. Um, when I say, "Well, I'm stressed," and my ADD symptoms are really sh- like mm-hmm. rearing their head, I tend to get a little bit more compassion and understanding. Got it. Um, so the payoff would be to be feel understood. Uh, or feel what's the word when you feel uh, yeah like it, it's a they go oh i see versus you're just crazy or you're not present or you hate us or whatever right 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 like it there's there's suddenly a a good explanation for why my performance is suffering a little bit more than everybody else's or you know something like well that. i was just gonna say it's interesting because you know one of the things uh, that's that keeps coming up when speaking to experts or, or just people with ADHD or parents of children with ADHD is like, well, you say it's the environment and you say it's distress or trauma or, you know, school or whatever, but uh, you know, we have four kids and only one has it. Well, yeah, because every single child is different, right? So it's almost like you said, oh, the employees around work, they're also stressed, but they're, they're doing fine. Well, they're not you, right? They're yeah. different people, so they might be doing okay. The question again would be going back to like, is this the environment you really want to be in? Like a hundred percent, super inspired, amazing, love it, driving it, my job, my company, my purpose, or is it just a really good job and you, but you happen to be stressed out in it. Right. Right. We can right. take it. We can take it almost also as a red flag of like, you're in an environment that's not really suited for you at that moment. Right. I mean, for me, I can say that I am incredibly fortunate to be working at a place that um, it it couldn't be more aligned with 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 my my purpose driven life, my my forward movement in my heart. Um, And and so one of the great things is I may experience a temporary spike of stress and ADD, but the purpose that I have that is so aligned with the job that I have um, brings me home really quickly. So I, I, I generally don't spend more than a couple of days in a sort of chaos zone mm. um, because I can return to that state of purpose and then I have actions to take mm. uh, in alignment with my work. Yeah. Um, and and the kind of work that I typically end up doing for my job is stuff that I can I can usually do when stressed out um, because at this point I've got it down and so there's a little bit of a system and yeah. you know, some element of the job is not systematic but the parts that I do have down that are vital for me to get done by certain period certain times um, those are systematic and I can kind of you know, just go, go through those motions. You have your steps. Yeah. And it's not life sucking. Right. Right. Because ultimately I know that it's, it's in alignment with my purpose. So the stress is not compounded by that. Yeah. 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 That's great. Well said. Now, what would you say? This is sort of a, uh, I have a series of kind of questions to, that I do to get research or to get insights into, into people's minds, right. Who have ADHD. Um, if somebody would tell you, uh, you say, oh, I have ADHD, and they say, no, you, you don't have ADHD because it doesn't exist. Like, what comes to, to what comes to mind? How would you react, or what do you say to that? I would say, well, I agree on a certain level. As a, um, ADHD is, to me, ultimately, like, personally, the way I relate to it, like, on a deeper level, is that... Um, it's a, just a phenomenon in language. Mm. Um, and it's a way of summing up certain characteristics. And 
ultimately that's all it really is. I don't think it's a path- pathological thing. You know, it's not a problem. ADD is not a problem. It is a way that some people are. <laughs> and it's not a bad thing, but um, it's also, I suppose, uh, it seems abnormal to certain people. And because of that, it's easier to explain to them that I, I have ADD than it is to sit down and say, well, I have this characteristic and this characteristic and this. well, you should just get to know me. You know, if I say, oh, I have ADD, then for the people who that resonates with, that we don't have to have further conversation yeah. about that stuff. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a shorthand, right? It's like, yes. yeah, totally. It's, I like what you said. You said the word struggle because I wonder if we could just, you know, as a society, if we could just say, oh, here's some things I struggle with but I'm working on it, right? Because I think in our society, the word struggle has become a negative thing. Oh, she really struggles with this. It's like, well, yeah, but that's that's life. You, you struggle with an environment and then you find a better environment or you get more centered or you heal yourself or you eat better or whatever you're gonna do to have that environment work for you, you will do. But if ultimately the environment doesn't work for you, you move on, right? So yeah. So I just feel like when we hear people say ADHD as in disorder, that what comes up is you're stuck with it. You can't outgrow it. It's just who you are. You're going to have it for life and medication is the only effective thing and it's genetic and blah, blah, blah. We've actually, I don't want to say the word debunked, but we have experts talking about all of these studies and they're totally taken out of context. They're not valid. Some of them are made up. And so I was just left with like, what is it? Right. And, and uh, I like what you said. It's it's uh, I forgot how you phrased it at the very beginning, but it's it's a set of um, uh, symptoms or uh, reactions to the environment or answers to the environment or to where you're at in life. And you happen to just use the best of it and try to make it work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um- and no, there's something that you said there that I I would like to highlight on a little bit because I did yep. find that for me managing the um, the difficulties of being in a system that goes often against or makes it more difficult to live my life in the way that my heart pulls me um, or mm-hmm. to say it another way. Um, makes ADD a lot harder to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is I I eat a I eat I tend to eat you know eighty twenty I eat a uh, really nutritious um, and lots of green vegetables and you know I um, I'm an herbalist so I use herbs and supplements and make sure that I'm getting all of the uh, building blocks for good neurotransmitters. I, um, I like nootropics are amazing. Um, and I like to take certain nootropics to, uh, help with brain function and, um, and things like that, um, just to make sure that the chemistry is balanced out. Um, but I found that the biggest, the biggest support, the biggest help for me Uh, is two things, things like meditation, meditative practices, things that get you into your body and clear your mind. Yeah. Um, so I really love like real Tantra, not, not sex. Like a lot of people don't realize that Tantra is not a a sexual practice. It's a spiritual practice of embodiment. Uh, Mm Um, I find that it is an incredible help to look at those concepts and to sort of adapt those into your way of being. Because I, I find that they're fairly natural for quote unquote ADHD people. Um, to be embodied and present is a very cornerstone uh, power of ADD. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is um, you know, the place where we met was Landmark. And that was a really big turning point for me because it gave me tools to eliminate um, narratives, unproductive narratives. And I find that unproductive narratives were actually sort of an addiction that made it a lot harder to navigate my mind in a uh, efficient way. Mm-hmm. So I became a much more efficient thinker. Um, in fact, I find that the more I'm in my heart, the less I think at all. 
Um, and so to completely release the need for thoughts to drive your actions. Um, I, I, I find that I absolutely do not need thoughts to drive my actions at all. I can be completely free and clear of thoughts and have uh, complete and total faith that my, my heart is driving my actions in a way that is aligned with my, my higher purpose. Mm. Um, and you know, and I keep realigning myself with that purpose every day and at any moment, anytime I've, I feel like I'm in question, what's my purpose? Um, what am I here for? I, I, and I have, you know, answers to those questions. It's not like that changes. I, I'm very, I have very clear answers mm. for, for what those are. So I, I check myself and nice, I nice. operate based on virtue as opposed to morality. Um, so it's an ethical approach as opposed to a rule-based approach. And I, I've found that the more I, I get my hands on that kind of an approach, the uh, more effortless my life is and the less I appear to have ADD in isolated moments. Now, if you were to look at like a map of Rebecca from like the top down and see all of the places and communities and things that I do and bounce between, that would probably be... be one of the most telling things that I'm an ADD person because um, the level of variety in my life, the level of adaptability that I have mm -hmm. um, and the um, amount of stimuli and experience that I like to hold. Um, I have multiple different community, big communities in my life that sometimes don't have a lot of crossover, but I just find that I love to have all of these different experiences and they don't necessarily show up all in one place. So that's where it's the most interesting to be me is to have such a wide variety of experiences and ability to be with them. And I notice that other people get so caught up in their interpretations and judgments and things like that, that they can't really experience things. But that's what my life is guided by is, is experience and, mm. and the, the width of experience that we can hold. And, and it's just a delight. I, I don't, I wouldn't change my brain for anything. For anything. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I and same here, you know. I was never officially diagnosed. I did it twice for the film, uh just and I took meds for the film just to kind of, you know, supersize mm -hmm. me, kind of try it out. And I was clear, same thing. I was like I can get there with some coffee, with meditation, breath work. I can mm -hmm. but what I've done you know, really heavily is I started really focusing on doing mostly what I want to do. And it wasn't easy at first because it's like, how do I make money and how do I support the family? And, but I got, I can't just do podcasts and there's no, income, you know, <laughs> but I figured out, you know, I figured out a way I got past my fears and I started uh, investing in real estate and some stocks. And I started finally figuring out a way where for 80% of the day, every day I can do what I want to do. Yeah. And there is no longer really an, an ADHD type of behavior from me because I literally go, I'm like, Ooh, now I'm going to sit, talk to that person. Now I'm doing a podcast. And yes, you know, you and I scheduled the podcast and I totally had it as 10 because I did two podcasts the last two days at 10, you know? So sometimes it comes in as I'm like, Oh shit. Uh, 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 but it's yeah. very, very few incidents, you know, because it's yeah. driven by passion and I love it. And yes. so, so what I'm hearing is a similar thing that you're, you know, you've carved out a path for your, your being or your brain to feel at ease and at home and inspired and comfortable. And, you know, you're reducing the amount of friction and struggles. And isn't that kind of what life is about anyway, you know, like find be in the flow and really, right? I, I, I think so. I think so. And I, I think that that's definitely 
um, a big part of it for you and I, at least, right. people with our experience. I can't speak That's for true. other people, but um, I would I venture to say that um, is one of the great gifts of ADD yeah. um, is that we have to find that or we suffer incredibly. We, we can't really be complacent in in this way because the misery that uh, emerges from it is so <laughs> insurmountable that you would just rather live out of a cardboard box than, yep. than deal with it, right? Like, I, I, I truly, truly would rather live out of my car than be a miserable person slogging to work in a you know, fluorescent light lit office building yep. every single day. That's just, I would much rather have some form of adventure, even um, if it sucked. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that that is, I hope that people can start to embrace ADD in a positive way for that reason, because I think that that is the gift that we have to give is um, to exemplify what it looks like to live by your heart. And I think that is where our lives are easier. I, I like that. I, that's a very, very well said. And um, I think we've gotten around a bit here. And I think uh, this is a good place to perhaps uh, wrap up our podcast. And I really, really appreciate you, you know, uh, sharing your life, sharing some of your struggles and what you've been through and, but also sharing your successes. And, you know, in this podcast, a lot of times we call an episode, you know, in your case, like Rebecca turned out, right. Or Ian turned out because a lot of parents are worried, is my child going to turn out right. Mm -hmm. If they have ADHD. And the answer is there's no normal one size fits all answer. Um, yes, we have hundreds of people now that are sharing their story that yes, they turned out they're okay. They're, they're living their lives. They're fulfilled. They have partners, they have businesses, they work, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, you know, nod to parents of like, guys, you don't have to stress them. They're not going to end up in jail, right? If you, <laughs> if you love them up and you raise them healthy and you give them, you know, the best you can, they will turn out and i think you you are living a living example of uh living a uh a purpose-driven you know creative inspired uh multifaceted life so i acknowledge you for that thank you and and thank you so much for having me on this podcast it's been a real pleasure and i think yeah yeah it's been this has been a really interesting year. And so I, I thrive on conversations like this. And so this opportunity has been great because there hasn't been a whole lot of them this year. And, uh, and so just getting to have this conversation with you has really brought me home to oh. uh, some of the stuff that I'm talking about. So thank you very much. And I love this project. My pleasure. 